Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage. By Quicken Loans, home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. The new Xbox One X, America's top young scientist, and holiday gift guides for cars and travel. Live from the Twit Eastside Studios in beautiful Petaluma, it's the new Screensavers. For our open, hello everybody! Welcome to the Screensavers episode 134, November 17th. I'm sorry, November 11th, 2017. Hello, Father Robert Ballas. Hello there. there, Leo Laporte, the digital Jesuit in the house. And as always, when it's me and Robert, the competition for the title of head geek. Is intense. It, it might it might get a little strange. We kind of just start pulling tech out of pockets and strange boxes and baskets. It's it's weird. Like we that. did this by accident the last yeah. time you were on. We had uh, uh, I, I, it ended up being like a he said she said or dueling <laughs> dueling geeks where you would come up with something and then I'd come. We we thought that was so much fun. We're going to do it with travel gadgets. Travel's good. I mean, we're all approaching that holiday season. We're all yeah. going to be either in a car or in a plane or in a villa somewhere. So. Yeah. What tech do you bring with you? That's kind of important. Leo. I got some really great stuff, and I know you do too. Here's the Project Scorpio. It oh. came out this week. The new Xbox One X. It's a 4K uh, video game console with HDR. We'll be joining just a little bit with Samet Sakar, the senior reporter from Polygon, who's gonna. He's reviewed it. He's looked at all the games. This is my personal edition. I spent much of uh, Thursday and Friday playing Call of Duty World War II <laughs> and uh, Assassin's Creed Origin. And because uh, I have... You, you seem to be stroking that a little bit, Leo. <laughs> I, love I'm just, uh, I love it. Kind of, it's I have precious. a 4K TV. You need a 4K. Well, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Do you need yeah. a 4K TV? Holiday gift guides coming up. We actually have two. So we're going to do the travel holiday gift guide. That's going to be a holiday gift guide. And then Tim Stevens, who's the car guy at CNET, is going to talk about, that's a nice holiday gift, the best cars to give for the holiday. Do you take those on travel? I mean, I don't know if that tech fits really You well know, a couple of years ahead. ago, I, uh, well, at least it was with me, but we got, I got her a new Audi with a big red bow on it. It's, I always wanted to do that. I all those ads, you know, where Santa Claus leaves a car in the driveway. I think Amazon will actually do that for you now. Big red bow, yes, leave buy it. Buy it now. I think it's a great, <laughs> buy it now price, $28,000, yeah. We're gonna talk to an 11 year old, actually Megan Maroney is, I was too scared Megan to. Maroney's an 11 year old? No, she's gonna to talk to the smartest 11 year old oh, you ever met. She's the uh, won the Young Scientist Challenge, the Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge. Brilliant young lady at the age of 11. We've got calls for help, we've got mailbags, but let's start with the big news of the week. This was a hard week to pick one story. It was, you know, there are weeks where it just kind of drags and you, you find the drags. There were a lot of really good stories this week. To me, the big story actually happened today. So this is uh, in the uh, in the West, this mm -hmm. is Veterans Day, right. commemorating 11-11-1918, the armistice that ended the Great War. And we commemorate on this day all of the men and women who have served our nation, and we thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, there's a big Veterans Day parade going on downtown in Petaluma. I know because I look up and I see P-38s. I see I see all sorts of vintage aircraft flying. We had Chinooks flying over the, the San Francisco Bay. It's wild, it, isn't it's it? It's kind of crazy. They have a Vietnam-era helicopter, uh, perfectly uh, accessorized. and uh, Anyway, let, let's thank you all for your service, those of you who have served our nation in the armed forces. We appreciate it. But in Asia, particularly in China, the 11-11-1111 is Singles Day. It's Single Sticks Day. It's a day of good luck. It's a day of good fortune. And it's a day where evidently you go crazy with the credit card. It's their Black Friday. It's yep. the biggest shopping. Now, to put this in perspective, 
Last year on Black Friday, Americans spent about three billion dollars, and that was a lot. I mean, it was that, a record. That was a record. On Cyber Monday, they spent even a little bit more. The following mm -hmm. month, about three and a half billion. That's the that's the record in the U.S. On this day in China, and they're just coming to the end of it. One merchant, Alibaba, which is admittedly like the Amazon of China, it's where most online purchases happen. One day, twenty-five billion. Dollars. That's ridiculous. I mean, it's not just twenty-five billion. They sold almost nine billion in the first hour. Hour of the sale. So this, this was just incredible. This smashed all the records. Th this is one of these things that kind of announces, uh, yeah, guys, this is a huge market, and if you're not in it, you're missing a lot of money. Yeah, you can see why uh, Apple and and Google and everybody else are trying to sell phones into that market and and all sorts of stuff. It's a, that's kind of mind-boggling, and that's just one merchant. That's not even. That's not the total amount spent. Now, do you think they obsess like we do after every Cyber Monday of how much productivity is lost <laughs> because people no. are re-clicking and checking the screens? No. Well, it's really interesting because what it also shows is there's disposable income in China, oh, yeah. which you don't really think of it that way, but that's become a real economic uh, uh, power. And, uh, and, and apparently there is more money to be spent. I remember when I was in China in 2009, uh, we talked with, we went to a small agricultural village. I mean, these aren't wealthy people. They're, they're, they're basically living off the land. Every one of them had an HDTV, a widescreen TV. Right. And our, uh, our interpreter told us, well, every year there's something that is the status symbol. In mm -hmm. years past, having air conditioning or a refrigerator. Uh, and in, in the year that we were there, it was having an HDTV. And you'd go into a very small, it wasn't a hut, but a very kind of simple house. And they had to have house, it. Yeah. And they had a big that was fancy it. TV. And so there is money to be spent, and there are, and there's certainly status. And so you can see why Apple is desperate to get in there with the iPhone 10 and so forth. $25 uh, billion. A, a lot of the analysts are breaking it down, and what they're starting to say is, look, the middle class, so I'm, I'm talking specifically about the financial component of it, is much larger in China. There's a lot of newly arrived wealth, right. newly minted right. wealth, and they're more willing to spend it than we are here in the West, in the United States. However, I, I don't think you can take away from the fact that some of that crazy expenditure was stuff you don't typically buy online. They sold yachts, they sold houses. <laughs> That's Someone bought a plane. Class. That's Someone bought a plane. That's a little higher. <laughs> but I mean, I don't think Amazon has has links for that. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. And they have no. Oh, you can buy a yacht on Amazon. No one's. I bet you could buy a yacht on. <laughs> a five hundred million dollar. You just yacht? need the credit card limit to be raised. <laughs> That's all. Uh, it, American Express. You may remember we talked all through this week. We didn't talk last week on the on uh, the show here, but uh, all through the week we talked about those weird videos. Did oh, you see gosh. any of those on YouTube, kids? Uh, they make. Absolutely no sense. I mean, you look at them and you're, you're wondering, who put, were you drunk when you created the title for this? And then you realize, oh, this is part of that algorithmically generated search optimized title that they right. do. They look for something that's hot and then they loosely create some bit of content that maybe touches one or two of those things and they release it and they get millions of views. They take advantage, in effect, of Google's, yep. uh, YouTube's algorithms because what happens is parents put a two year old, a nonverbal kid, sometimes, maybe even a younger, in front of the iPad, and they start watching videos. They start in a, in a you know, Peppa, yep. Peppa, yep. what is it, Peppa Parrot? Peppa, <laughs> Peppa Pig? I haven't they start with the Peppa Pig with or, or Phineas and Ferb, something normal, but what happens because of the algorithm is it starts yep. recommending on the right-hand side an auto-playing weirder and weirder video, and some of it's disturbing. Look, there's Mickey Mouse in a pool of blood. Some of it's very, very disturbing. Uh, anyway, there was a number of articles written about this, and YouTube says, oh, we planned on cracking down all along. That's the weakest <laughs> response ever. It's like, yeah, we knew this was bad, but, you know, we yeah. were going to take care of it we later. Were gonna, yeah, we were going to do that anyway. anyway. The good news is they are starting to block some of these videos. The problem is that there's many of them. And so it is a difficult challenge. Some of them are put up there by 4chan and others, they're, they're lulls videos intentional, but most of them, as you say, are completely algorithmically generated by you know sweatshops trying to make money on YouTube advertising. And, and the scary thing about this is we've always had this. People have always tried to game the system, but they can do it automatically now. Yeah, and it's, that's the real problem. Yeah, and, and you know what, here's the thing. Google has always been afraid of this. This is why they've been so secretive about their algorithms. It's, look, we want to be open with you, but if we give you what we do, it makes it much easier to game. Yeah. Well, it's now much easier to game. Yeah, it's, it, it, and, and I hate to think how a one-year-old who doesn't really understand yeah. what she's seeing on there is going to be weirdly 
bent by this stuff or disturbed, very upset, and mom and dad may not even know why, because the music is happy and the colors are well, bright. When I was a kid, there was the whole debate about, oh, well, TV is destroying America's <laughs> youth, because, oh, you're using it as a substitute. This ain't Mr. Ed. We're talking... Yeah. Although that's a talking horse is disturbing. It is. is actually, a lot of the TV I watched when I was a kid was very disturbing. My mother, the car. That's a little weird, okay? I'm just saying. Maybe this isn't new. Even Leave It the Beaver is kind of disturbing if you watch it late enough. Speaking of social media, Sean Parker, former president of Facebook, one of the guys who was there at the beginning, uh, said some things that are not going to make uh, no. his buddy Mark Zuckerberg happy. No. He's no longer at Facebook, but he says he talks about when Facebook. This was an interview with Axios. He gave a talk when Facebook was getting going. He said, "I had these people would come up to me and they would say, I'm not on social media.'" And I would say, "Okay, you know, you will be." They would say, "No, no, no, no. I value real life interactions. I value the moment. I value presence. I value intimacy. Intimacy." And I would say, "We will get you eventually," but he says, "I don't know if I really understood the consequences of what I was saying." Because of the unintended consequences of a network when it grows to a billion, or as Facebook has, two billion regular users, it literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. It probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. And God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. Now, here's the thing, Leo. This is absolutely true, but this is not new. We said the exact same thing at the start of the Industrial Revolution, that it changes the nature of work and therefore it's going to change what we think is normal in, in society. It's true. When books yeah. first came out, people said, children today, instead of going outside and getting fresh air, they're reading too much. Okay, I agree with you. There's a certain amount of techno panic that goes along with any new technology. But, it, but, but he does have a valid point in that Facebook and all the other social media sites have normalized a way of relating to other people that most of us, if we were able to step back, would say, that's not good. That's weird. Yeah, that's weird. Maybe that's not normal. He says the inventors, me, Mark Zuckerberg, Kevin Systrom at Instagram, understood this consciously, but we did it anyway. Right. And, and that's the thing that bothers me. I, without much thought about the consequences of what they're doing, they created basically a highly, they created heroin. They created crack for social interaction. And they knew they were doing that. They, the algorithms worked to make it more and more addictive. And they didn't really think about, well, what's society going to be like at the other end of this thing? Well, the hack is what we call, it's a validation loop. And right. you can get that from shopping. You can get that from any pleasurable experience. But in social networking, it's particularly vicious because it's so fast. Yes. The loop runs so quickly. You post something. And then you watch to see who likes it. Well, but who, that's who the other problem. It. It's gotten really good because it's algorithmic. Yep. They have tons of data with so many people. And the algorithm, they could just set it and forget it. And it you. optimizes and optimizes and optimizes and optimizes. And it, in effect, makes it better than any human really could have in real time. And, and so that's why it, it's worrisome. Because um, you saw it with, for instance, World of Warcraft. Some people actually oh died goodness. playing World of Warcraft. And StarCraft. And, and StarCraft. It's because Blizzard was able to watch... A perfect example, uh, the, you know, you'd go into a, what do they call it? When you go into a realm and, and you do a battle with a group of other people. It's uh, a quest, yeah, right? Raid, a quest. A raid. So you go into a raid. Now, Blizzard's watching with great interest what gets people into raids, what engages them, what makes mm -hmm. them be there longer, because the more time you spend, the better it is for them, right? And they optimize it. They found out, oh, well, it's a loot. We, they want more loot. They want certain kinds of loot. And they, in, an, in, a, in a very powerful loop, made this more and more and more addictive. And it's literally addictive in the sense that yeah. it's dopamine it, it's hits biochemically in addictive. your brain. We enjoy it. Now, the, the thing is, how do you stop this? You can't really legislate against it. No, I don't want that. Because this is the basis of marketing. But I think what we can do, and this is important for us as media folk, we can educate people. We can warn because people. If, if you know what's happening, it's possible to break out of yeah. that loop. That's what we want. What I did, uh, I still am a user of Facebook, but I took it off my mobile devices. So I only use it on the desktop, which by itself constrains it. I can't wake up in the middle of the night and, and, and use Facebook for an hour. Right. I can't, you know, and I think that that was a useful thing for me to do. I, it's funny, I took Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter off, and I, I put Twitter back, because <laughs> how do you know what to do when there's an earthquake without Twitter, right? Do you know that, how do you know if, uh, you know, somebody, a celebrity died. You don't know unless you could check Twitter. Used to be, when I was a kid, you'd turn on the news radio. Right. Right? They're slow compared to Twitter. Twitter knows. I, I do the simple thing, Leo. I, there are no chargers in my bedroom. 
So I have to leave everything in my office. That's actually a great idea. Yeah, yeah that's actually a great idea. Are there plug sockets in your bedroom? Oh, there are plug sockets, oh, okay. but I, oh, I won't connect it. <laughs> I'm not putting plug sockets in my I have a lamp, that's about bed. it. <laughs> and some candles. Finally, last story, uh, Google, of course, Google knows all, and uh, occasionally they tell a little bit. They analyzed a case study teamed up with the University of California, Berkeley, how hijackers take over Google accounts between March 2016 and March 2017. And what they came up with was, I thought, very interesting. Uh, we applied its insights to our existing protections, secured 67 million Google accounts before they were abused. They looked at black hat tools, third-party password breaches. They looked at the black markets for passwords. Mm -hmm. Of all of that, in one year, 788,000 credentials stolen via keyloggers. See, that was something we worried a lot about, but that's a fraction of the real it's problem. It's a very small percentage. 12 million via phishing, 3.3 billion yeah. third-party breaches. However, phishing turned up, as far as they were concerned, to be the really big problem. And so educating, he says, by ranking the relative risk to users. See, a password breach doesn't have the broad scope, mm -hmm. the broad range of a phishing attack. We found that phishing posed the greatest threat, followed by key loggers and third-party breaches. In other words, phishing could get ransomware on your system. Yes. That's no compared to somebody knowing your Yahoo account. That's devastating. So, I, you know, I don't know what the action item is here, except uh, you know more. Of course, anybody watching this show knows more than enough not to get fished. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your coworkers. If you run a company as we do, it might be a good time to do a little training, not just on fishing, but on social engineering. You know, the call to the front office saying. Uh, hey, this is Joe down in accounting. I, I forgot my password. Can you get me logged in here? That kind of thing. Really important to train people to be a little savvy and a little cynical. Yeah. Well, we deal with this on the enterprise side all the time because, well, that's where most of the really in interesting data is stored. And what we've found over the years is that systems themselves, so if I run X Corporation with 10,000 seats, I probably have a pretty good policy about what my data does and what my employees can access. So that's not really where the problem is. Yes, I have to educate my users. Yes, I have to make sure that no one falls to a phishing attack, but I can relatively well control what goes mm -hmm. on in mm -hmm. my network. What this study does show you, though, is, is A, the weak point is always, always, humans. always going to be humans. Humans. And B, the second component of that is anytime my network has to touch another network. This is all that oh, third yeah. party time yeah, because yeah. that's normally where the failure is. Their network may be secure, my network may be secure, but if my network needs to talk to his network, there's always that problem of, well, did we design them correctly? Ours, our networks aren't exactly the same, do our policies match up? There's not enough attention to being paid to that and unfortunately, we, we pay for that. I mean, how many times on Security Now has Steve talked about, oh, well, this happened because X had an API that wasn't quite secured? It, it, and unfortunately, target that's going to keep happening. Remember the target yeah. breach? Yeah. That happened because their HVAC contractor mm -hmm. <laughs> had access to their company network. Because he needs that. Yeah. yeah. And the target folks would lock it down, but what they didn't realize is that the HVAC people were hacked. They got a phishing scam, and that just led them right into the target, and there was the target breach. <sighs> All right, we're going to take a break. We have a call for help coming up. You and I are going to face off in a duel over travel, uh -oh. our travel gadget gift guide. We have some amazing stuff coming up for you. But first, a word from our sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. If you're on the, on the make looking for a new place, you want to get a home loan to buy that great place you want, I could give you a tip right up front. If you're going house hunting, pre-approved. Get pre-approved for a mortgage. It makes it so much easier. And it's very competitive these days. It really is a seller's market. If you're going in and making an offer and you don't already have that letter that says, I'm approved, you're going to take second fiddle to somebody who does. So get a jump on the mortgage. Go right now to rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. It's Quicken Loans, the best lender in the nation. I, I can say that without hesitation, and I, I, you can even confirm this independently. Number one in customer satisfaction in the U.S., according to J.D. Power, seven consecutive years. That's pretty darn good. And I have to say they've earned a soft spot in my heart because they've made a product just for us geeks people who don't want to go to the bank to get a loan, who don't want to go to the attic to get all the paperwork. We just want to do it all quick, fast, and easy online. And Rocket Mortgage is exactly that. You can buy a home or refinance your existing home on your smartphone or your tablet or your browser. 
without going to get any papers, without going to the bank, you simply go to rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Answer a few questions. They have trusted partners with all the big financial institutions so they can get the information they need easily the minute you say, yeah, let's apply. Then, based on your income, your assets, and credit, they're going to analyze all the home loan options for which you qualify, give you the choice of term, rate, down payment, find the one that's just right for you. And you know what's amazing? They don't do that in days or hours. They do it in minutes. You could, you, truthfully, you could do it at an open house. Before you leave, you could show the realtor, I'm approved. It's awesome. I love the part at the end. I don't know if we'll get to the end of the video here, where after you go through all this, there's a button on the screen that says, download my approval letter. You download it, you print it, you got it, you're done. Rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. To buy or to refi. Rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. We thank them so much for their support of the new screensavers. Are you ready? Oh, yes. What are we doing? I just uh, dropped my cards. Is it time for not Xbox? Yet. It's time for an Xbox. Scorpio! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am. This came uh, on uh, Tuesday, this uh, November 7th. This is what we've been waiting for. The Xbox One X, a.k.a., as it says right here, Project Scorpio. I ordered it from Microsoft early, and so I got the special edition. Nothing fancy at all. It just has this written on it. But, <laughs> but this, it, this is exciting because this is the next generation console. They don't come out. New, new generations only come out no. every five to ten years. They're so. going to slow down. They're going to slow down. I, I mean, think this yeah. may be... <laughs> Anyway, the end of the line. There's the PS4 Pro and there's this, both 4K. Mm -hmm. We thought we'd get an expert, though, somebody who's played with it for some time on the phone from a Polygon, Samit Sarkar. Hey, Samit. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you, Polygon. Of course, the, pre the preeminent gaming website. Uh, everybody, well, it is. I mean, I don't think that's uh, saying anything yeah. out of school. Uh, the it's first thing I guess we should ask about is... How many titles available for the Scorpio, the One X, uh, take advantage of its capabilities, chiefly 4K and HDR? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You have uh, at launch that you know it just launched earlier this week, as you said. So I, I think Microsoft was promising something like 70 games in in that first week, um, and they've got something like 160 Holy or cow. more lined up. You know, uh, there are some games that that are getting updates in, in the in the coming months. And, and, and what I really liked is that some of my existing games are downloading 4K assets. Yes. Yeah, uh, and, and so that, that's something you can do on your uh, e Xbox One or your Xbox One S to prepare for the launch of the Xbox One X if, if you're you know, planning to get one uh, this week or you know, maybe for the holidays or Black Friday or even at some point in the future, you can download that stuff ahead of time and that way you can just transfer it directly to the Xbox One X and uh, you know it, that stuff will be ready to go. Now, I, I enjoy a tech demo as much as the next person. <laughs> I'd love to show off something that no one else has, but you know, one of the things for me has always been about the, the game content itself. I like my titles. I love what I've been playing in the past. Is, is that going to be jarring to move it over from where I was to, to a, a new Scorpio? It's actually really easy to migrate from a, an existing console to a new one. Uh, Microsoft offers a few different ways to do it. So one is that you can hook up both the you know, your existing Xbox and the Xbox One X to the same uh, network, uh, your, your home network, and then you can just do a direct console to console transfer over the network. And uh, you can actually, it won't, you don't have to copy the entire thing. You can choose exactly which games and apps you want to bring over. Oh, and, oh. I got desynchronized. <laughs> <laughs> I did, uh, so that's one way you could do it over the network. Yeah. Uh, but I did what you recommended at first, which is I went into my uh, Xbox. Uh, I had a One S, right? But right. you could have an Xbox One, and I said, download the 4K content, and I put it on an external drive. I moved everything to an external drive, which made it very easy to just take the new Xbox and plug in the external drive, and everything was there already, which I thought was great. Yeah, yeah and and what's great about the external system is that. You know, you only have to copy it once effectively. You know, you can copy it to the external drive and then just plug that into your Xbox One X and play everything off the hard drive. You never have to copy it, you know, from the external to the Xbox One X's internal hard drive because it, it you know, supports uh, running games directly off the external. I, uh, I downloaded a couple of new games. I got Call of Duty, the, uh, the World War I edition. 
Uh, and then this is, of course, Assassin's Creed Origins. We're in ancient Egypt. They look good. Oh. They really look good. I have to say, yeah. what, what's your favorite for 4K HDR content? You know, uh, those are, are two games that really show off the capabilities of the Xbox One X. Uh, I'm a sports guy, so uh, I was checking out Madden NFL 18. Oh, over yeah, that looks so good, huh? Looks amazing. You know, that's a 4K. I believe it's a native 4K, and uh, it already ran at, at 60 FPS. And, and that's a game where, you know, you, you just see the sun glinting off of the helmets and, and details like that. Uh, it, it really um, it really comes out in, in 4K and HDR if you have a, a 4K TV, which, of course, is... You know, I would strongly recommend that to anyone who is thinking of buying an Xbox. Well, in fact, should you even consider the One X without a 4K TV? Well, honestly, that's how I... Uh, you know, in speaking with my editors at Polygon, that's how we approached the review. We, we wanted to... You know, put ourselves in the shoes of someone who was considering an Xbox One X, but you know maybe hadn't upgraded yet to a 4K TV, and which I think is still the majority of the the consumer base. Uh, you know, they're they may not have upgraded yet. Um, certainly, the the people who are probably considering an Xbox One X are more likely to have a 4K sure. TV because they're sure. you know they're sort of on the cutting is edge. Is there a there. benefit though if you have an HD just an HD TV? Is it is it faster, better frame rate? I mean, can it do yeah, more? Yeah. So. So you, you do definitely get some benefits, even if you're if if you haven't upgraded yet to a 4K TV. So the number one thing you, you mentioned downloading the 4K assets, that's something that you won't have a choice in. If you have an Xbox One X, even if you're playing on a 1080p TV, it's still going to download those 4K assets because what it does is that uh, it uses a technique called super sampling, whereby it renders the game at a higher resolution and then downscales it to fit your screen, and so you still get. Um, a higher quality image, even though you know you're not, you're not getting all the pixels per se. It's it's gonna have much better anti-aliasing, meaning you know fewer oh, jagged edges. Okay. Okay. And um, uh, e even beyond the visuals, there uh, sometimes you'll have games that are uh, way more um, you know just way way higher fidelity, or um, they'll they'll run at the same frame rate, but it's smoother, meaning there are fewer. Uh, instances of of chugging in, in right, the image, right. or even if you, you're know, looking at a game like Gears of War 4 right now, what's really impressive there is that on a regular Xbox One or Xbox One S, the campaign and the horde mode in Gears 4 they just run at 1080p and 30 frames per second. But on an Xbox One X, it's powerful enough that even you know if you haven't upgraded to a 4K TV at 1080p, you can still run that game at 60 FPS. So it's a way smoother, more fluid, more responsive experience if you have an Xbox One X on a 1080p. There. Now, it's, it's interesting because so many people are focusing on the 4K, but for me, the, the best advance, the one that really makes the most visual difference is the addition of HDR. I mean, HDR, it changes how scenes look, and it, it actually makes the old gaming look bad. You realize, oh, that's not HDR. That's, <laughs> that's not as dark as it can get. That's not as bright as it can get. It's, you know, is, that, is that something that more of the titles are going to take advantage of? Because, again, right now, there's only a couple of sort of showcase titles. I'd like to see that feature in everything. Absolutely, and I think it's a little tougher for some of the older titles. Uh, in, in my conversations with developers, what they've said is that um, you really have to almost develop a game with HDR in mind right. because it's, it's a, a totally different, you know, um, system. It, the way it works now is is they use thing called tone mapping, where they're kind of, um, you know, revising the the image to to fit the the color depth. Um, and uh, increased, you know, uh, uh, contrast range that HDR offers, um, and and for some games like you were showing some footage of, of Halo 3 there, that's a 10-year-old game. Uh, it actually does have a, a you know more expanded color palette and and uh, better lighting, but they didn't, put, they weren't able to do full HDR on that, just because it it would have made things look kind of wonky. Um, I think you know going forward, you know, new games that are being developed from here on out, hopefully, we'll see. HDR on, on the majority of those going forward. Yeah, the, the developers I spoke with at uh, GDC, they, they basically said, look, when you go from HD to 4K, it's nice because you can get more detail, but you can essentially sample up your games because most of them are, you, you've got the original renders and making the new content is not that much more difficult. They said, however, when you start making games for HDR, it doesn't just change the resolution, it changes how you design the game. You can do more things if you know you have the HDR capability built in. And they, they basically said the exact same thing that you did, which is, look, maybe in future titles, but you can't really go back and just add HDR because then it's just gimmicky. Although, I have to say, look at this Xbox yeah. 360 version of Halo compared to the one 
X version of Halo. Oh, what a plan. Yeah. yeah. Now I can get fragged in high-definition and HDR. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I used to be good at that game, and then I got old, and now I'm just a target. People are recommending Forza also. Madden 18, but Forza also. See, I'm not a sports gamer or a... I drive for, you know, as an adult, I drive. So, <laughs> but it looks good, I have to say. It really is pretty impressive. Yeah, and, and you know, going back to what you're saying about benefits on a, on a 1080p TV, even if you don't have 4K, you'll still benefit from a much shorter loading time. Yeah, in, that's big. In yeah. our tests, um, because uh, I believe it has a 50% faster hard drive than the uh, previous Xbox One X versions, um, you know, there were some games where load times were cut in... In half, or or even better, I was saw I, I saw a, um, a colleague post a video of actually it was Madden. He was loading into a franchise mode game, and I think the Xbox One, the original one, loaded. It took like a minute wow. to load into a franchise mode game, and it was 20 seconds on the Xbox One. <laughs> now, I, one was, the, the One S was it a 5400 RPM drive? Do you know what the drive is in the Scorpio? I'm not sure. I don't think they've released the specific. I don't think they've said, yeah. For, for it, but it's not um, an SSD. Alas. Can I mod it to? Add I an want SSD? you to put an SSD I, in. Oh, here. let's do. I was so <laughs> do that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, uh, we actually had a good question from our chat room. Beatmaster was wondering about this. You know, of course, the experience is going to be online. Is there a competitive advantage to to having a more powerful console? I mean, even if you're not taking advantage of HDR and 4K. A faster console that has less lag, that loads more quickly, do do they need to do anything to nerf those people who have faster hardware? No, um, I think what the developers that I've spoken with are doing for, for the online games, uh, you know, Destiny 2 is one of them that they're going to update next month to support the console. Um, they always want to maintain the integrity of the online experience no right. matter what you're playing on. So, you know, there's no difference in terms of the experience you get they're, se- they're not separating out Xbox One players from Xbox One X players. Um, and, and that's why a lot of people were wondering with a game like Destiny 2, which if you have a PC, that game looks incredible on, on a PC and you can run it at 60 FPS or even up to like 144 FPS if you've got the monitors to handle it. But the Xbox One X is probably powerful enough to run Destiny 2 at 60 FPS, but they just wanted to make sure because they were going to have people playing on all... All different kinds of consoles that they they wanted to keep it at 30 fps so there was no advantages on either side oh, that sucks. Uh, yeah but it makes sense <laughs> i mean it does it does make sense i mean that's why i play single player only i don't want to <laughs> play online ever hey what about the ps uh, pro ps4 pro that's an that's a 4k uh device as well and of course as we know sony and microsoft in kind of a bitter war although sony's been winning 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 all along uh does it how does it compare do you guys look at that as well you're not just an Xbox guy. No, no, not at all. And, you know, in the games that we've seen so far, uh, I think Microsoft's uh, promises um, have been borne out. They've, they've delivered on the promises you know, to say that multi-platform games, they will look and run better on the Xbox One X. It's simply a, a significantly more powerful device than the PS4 Pro. I think what people have to decide for themselves is, you know, is it... That much more powerful, you know, powerful, uh, more powerful enough to, to justify the cost because it is a hundred dollars more expensive than a PS4 Pro. Um, and uh, oh, but you know what you get for the hundred bucks, you get a UHD Blu-ray player, right? That's true. That's true. I, you know, to me I, that was important. That's my Blu-ray player, my my UHD me too. player. It, yeah, it's I I've actually been buying up some 4K Blu-rays in the past year because I knew I was going to get an Xbox right. One X. <laughs> you know, unlike you, I, I didn't have an S because yeah. I knew the. Xbox One X was coming, but right. most people I know, they don't care about, about 4K Blu-rays. They're not buying physical media anymore, right? Yeah, that's true. Alas. But it does look a lot better it does. than I, any streaming 4K. Well, I'm looking at the iFixit teardown of the Scorpio. It is a 5400 Seagate, R, uh, 5400 RPM Seagate drive. We could so it's that. not a faster drive. We could really fix that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just but it, Well, it's faster because I guess because it's a faster processor. and it, uh, You know, I, it's an interesting question on a, on a device like this. How much of the load time is hard drive access and how much is, is it, you know, moving stuff around, putting textures in memory, crunching stuff? And uh, you know, decompressing stuff. I imagine they've done a really good job of balancing that. So it's yeah. loading yeah. throughout the level. You, it's not going to chug you. You do have a, a slightly longer load time, but I mean, if you can deal with a slightly longer load time, there should there should technically be no difference between a 5400 RPM and an SSD once you get into the level. 
Well, so yeah, once you're that's, uh, that's the cost. It's got, yeah, it's got a lot more memory than the previous Xbox One X versions, right. and uh, you know they, uh, from what I understand, they've they've added some that you know basically there were developers who were like, well, we had this extra memory that we didn't really know what to do with, so we used it for you know, <laughs> caching, storing, <laughs> storing assets and things like that, right. and, and caching, and that really improved that makes a difference. Uh, eight, eight, eight core system on a chip. 2.3 gigahertz is a lot of horsepower. You've got power. a Scorpio pin. We were at PepCon and they gave oh, you the Oh, I forgot my Scorpio pin. pin. I should have yeah. worn it today. I gave, I gave mine to day. Alex. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is pretty powerful. I shouldn't say that the competition is just the PS4 Pro. It's also PC gaming. How, right. how close does this come to PC? If I had a high-end gaming PC and Call of Duty World War II, which would you play on? Well, this is the thing with the Xbox One X that you know we're getting at here, which is that I think for people who are asking for a simple buy recommendation, a yes or no, it really is going to depend on your personal preferences and your setup. And and there's so many you know caveats and so many well, if this, then maybe. Yeah. Um, for yeah. example, you know I have a gaming PC. It doesn't have a super powerful graphics card in there. But for me, I, like I spend nine, ten hours a day at a desk. I don't want to come home and then keep gaming at a desk. I want to sit on my couch where I've got a 50-inch 4K TV instead of my 24-inch 1080p computer monitor. And and so you know, I I like playing PC games, but I, I prefer console gaming for that reason. However, it's it's not a stretch to say that for most people who've got a high-end gaming rig, they're going to get a higher fidelity experience. You yeah. know. Yeah. Even if they're not running the game at 4K, they're gonna, you know, most games they're gonna get 60 FPS out of on a PC, and and you know there are some games that do that on the Xbox One X, uh, Forza as you mentioned, that's one of them, 4K 60 FPS native uh, as far as I understand, um, but I think for for more people who are into high end game, um, you know, P PC games, uh, they really prefer the, f the fidelity of the frame rate more so than the resolution. So even if they're playing it, you know, yeah, 40p or yeah. 1080p, they that. they really want that that fluidity that of 60. Yeah. And this this is 60 for most games. By the way, there's the pin, Alex. Oh, that's Alex. so cute. Isn't that nice? And it says on the back, it says, "I was I was there. I launched the world's most powerful console." <laughs> you got to have the bragging rights. It's the is it the world's most powerful console, Samet? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it, that is a fair thing for Microsoft to say. Uh, it's, it is more powerful than the PS4 Pro. Um, and and uh, I think we're seeing a shadow of war here. That's one game where uh, apparently Look it Look looks you know, <gasps> significantly amazing. better you know, than, or, or you know, looks or runs better than the PS4 Pro version in a way that's, that's sort of yeah. noticeable. Yeah. Um, and so I think for people, a lot of them are wondering, well, you know, the multi-platform games, yes, they'll run better, but maybe I already have a PS4 Pro. You know, do I care about Microsoft's first-party games? And that's where I think Microsoft is lacking. At this point, they they don't have the, the first-party lineup that, that has really resonated with people. Uh, Gears 4 was pretty successful last year, but, and, and you know, Forza is, is a perennial uh, top-selling um, game, but it's, it's racing, which is a pretty small niche there. Um, if, if you look at Sony, they've had some huge successes with uh, games like uh, Horizon Zero Dawn earlier this year and, and uh, The Last Guardian last year. I think you know Microsoft said recently that they are um, renewing their investments in, in first-party development in, in you know, their own uh, Xbox exclusives. And so we'll have to see what comes out of that over the next few years. Certainly Halo 6 is coming at some point. That's one thing that's really been different in the last two launches from Microsoft. In the past, you'd choose a console based on exclusives. Right. You say, "Well, I want Gears of War," or "I want uh, well, Uncharted," right. and and so that would make the decision for you. But that's not really been the case with the One S or the One X. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, yes, this is by far the most powerful console on the planet. The question is, does, it have does the that games matter? You yeah, I mean, it doesn't people have... people are playing for the if games. You want to play that's Uncharted? Why Nintendo it's not Switch gonna... is doing so well right now. <laughs> yeah, right. If you want to play Zelda. Uh, but do, but you know somebody's saying in this uh, this is a sad uh, statement that the PC version of Call of Duty World War II is slowed down <laughs> so that it will be on parity with the uh, well, console version. Well, you have and to do a, that. That's if, that's not. If you want cross cross guess, platform multiplayer, you I have guess, to do that. I guess. All I can say is playing World War II in my recliner, eight feet away from my 70-inch 4K UHD display. 
is the closest I'm ever going to come to Omaha Beach. It is an amazing, that would be a game in itself, just getting from the landing craft uh, up the beach is, I have yet to succeed. <laughs> it's and it's really hairy, but it's very realistic. And I think it gives you an appreciation on this Veterans Day for what those, uh, the greatest generation uh, went through. Well, the visually, yes, I, I will not yeah, compare. No, I'm actually not going to get did, shot, but, but yeah. it, it's pretty hairy. It, it's a really amazingly vivid experience, and I was playing a little bit of Assassin's Creed Origins, and it, it, I have to say it's the most fun I've had in playing Assassin's Creed in a couple of generations. So this is a this is a, a I'm I'm thrilled. Let me put it that way. I'm happy with it, uh, and it sounds like it's a good purchase, but it's not an obvious purchase. It really no. depends on a lot of other factors, as Sammy has pointed out. Read all about it. Uh, Samit Sakar at Polygon.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, which one are you playing tonight? Oh, me personally, I was uh, playing Wolfenstein 2, actually, just before uh, we recorded the show. Achtung! Achtung! I'm old Carry enough on, to have played sir. it on an Apple II when the, <laughs> when the Nazis couldn't really talk because they didn't have a voice generator. <laughs> It all sounded like that. I had it on a Nokia phone. <laughs> Did you really? 380. Wolfenstein? Yeah. Wow. Sammy, <laughs> Sammy, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Of course. Take nice care. to talk. Nice to talk to you. When Samit uh, mentioned that he was going to be on the, the new screensavers, a bunch of people on Twitter said, that's still a thing? Yes, it's, <laughs> oh, it's come still on. a thing. I'm a little grayer, but it's still a thing. You know what else we do? We still do calls for help. And we're going to go to Worthing, England this time to say hello to Will. Hello, Will. Hey, how are you guys? Very nice to see you. You don't sound so British. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am. Uh, people, people, I've always had that. And people say different. I, I, they can't tell where I'm from. But yeah, I'm British. You're British. All right. When he said that, I, I, no, I, I detected it comes, a little comes through. Tiny, <laughs> tiny bit of accent. So what can we do for you, Will? Okay, so... My friend's got a Raspberry Pi and he wants to block ads and he wants to do it at DNS level with um, something called Pi-hole. And yeah, basically I, I've looked into how you, how you do it and the different ways you can do things. But I basically want to make sure we do it right and we don't cause any problems. I don't want to you know, cause any security issues. And if there's any pitfalls already. Don't mess with the uh, BGP is my recommendation. Yeah, don't. <laughs> don't, don't mess with the border gateway protocol at all. That could bring the whole internet down. No, you can't do no, that with a pie can't. hole. <laughs> this is a pie hole. Right here. This is this is a little pie hole. This is a, I'm, I'm messing around with a case right now that actually does away with the USB. It's got its own internal power, so you can actually mount this. Uh, when I'm done, it'll also have a little headless screen on the top so that it will tell you its IP address in case you want to run this in a portable application. So is this basically a router? Uh, well, no. So what I'm using this as is a DNS caching server. It's not a DNS ah. server. It's not actually storing routes, okay. but it will go out to the uh, DNS provider of my choice. In this particular case, I've set it up to, to use Google, and it will pull down any of my DNS queries, but then it will eliminate any of the 100,000 plus domains and oh, subdomains sweet. that the pie hole people have identified as ad serving domains. So, so, so the, 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 the you know, steps would be, my, I go to my browser, open my browser, I say, I want to go to twitter.com. The browser says, I don't know where that is, says, sees if it has it in its own cache, doesn't. Then goes out to what it thinks is the router, but first it goes to the pie hole. Correct. And the pie hole says, "Oh, I know where Twitter is," but it checks it against its database. Right. If it didn't know, it would then go to the router, and it would then the router would go to your ISP. Or well, th th and this is important. This is actually not routing any packets. Which no, which, I understand. Yeah. So you still need a router. You still need a router. The router is inside this. Where is the router? Oh, no. So the router is your, your central router. Okay. Uh, that's that's still acting as your gateway. All this is going to do is serve up your DNS request. So you so have to tell the So it would sit between the router it. and the modem. Right, uh, but so notice how there's only one network cable coming out of yeah, this. Yeah, I don't understand how this works. Right, so this this is just going to sit on my network as a device. What? It, it just looks it's like It's not in device. between anywhere, it's just not another device. Not in between anywhere. I just have to tell my clients ah. that their DNS server is this device. You point your, and you have to do that in each and in, in every computer and phone, that the that the, uh, the the DNS gateway is not 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 Correct. But is whatever, this uh, 10 .132, 132, it's a local address. Right. Okay. Okay, now, it's a no network address. Okay. You, you do have to do that. However, you can also use the settings inside of your router. Any router in the last 10 years has the ability to tell any DHCP client, so that's your laptop, that's oh. your desktop, that's your phone, what to use, use this server. Ah, so you could do it in your router you, one you setting. You can't, right. Okay. right. Okay. Uh, and you know what? I've been playing around with this thing, 
and it's actually quite phenomenal. If you, Is it speedy enough? That would be one concern. Yes, because you're not routing packets. If you were trying to use this as a router, you absolutely would hit the limit. You, you would not be able to, to push through the packets fast enough to, to not slow down your connectivity. But because it's only doing DNS requests, it, it's not even doing Pi those, it's doing a lookup, right? It, it's yeah, got yeah. A, it's got a, a table in there and it's doing a lookup on the table and it, saying right? precisely yeah, it's yeah, actually okay. it's actually quite good in fact if you have got my computer so i've got this set up right now you know you can see where in the page those ads were supposed to be wow. so there was one supposed it to be it just kills them just yeah they don't even serve they just first party they ads just will disappear. go through but third party ads will be blocked very i'm glad you picked up on that if they are served natively so if you're on facebook and the ad comes from facebook they're going to go through or youtube Right, yeah. but if they don't, and uh, actually, if you go back to my computer, you can see it here. These are this is the oh, the status that. screen of the pie hole. So this is built into the uh, the administrative page. It'll show you how many queries you've blocked. It will show you the top destination. So right now, it's uh, absscorecardresearch.com is is being hit a lot. Uh, you get ad, double click. You get Google services. These are the domains that get filtered out and they they actually end up speeding up your connection sure because they do you're not even downloading that stuff it's not like a third-party ad blocker where you're blocking at the browser they don't even make it through your connection can you configure so I noticed for instance Google Analytics gets blocked can you say I don't want to block Google Analytics I kind of we, we did a know-how on this and I kind of I wasn't really big on the whitelist uh, you can and there actually See, is I, a I don't like the idea for instance of blocking analytics because I think of my site and others where that's how we know how many people visited our site. There's no, I don't consider it an intrusion. Right. It's not, you know, it's just how we measure traffic. And for some sites, that's an important number. So in here, I can add any whitelisted sites okay. I okay. want to yeah. add. So However, you, oh. the issue with this is a lot of those tracking uh, services like analytics and, and Twitter analytics, they will actually use multiple domains. Oh. And so trying to figure out all ones? of the ones yeah. it uses without allowing ad serving domains to come in, that's kind of a cat and mouse game. Well, the good news is not enough people, this is such a uh, advanced solution that not so many people are gonna use it that it's gonna really impact, for instance, our ability to count our right. viewers, maybe a few percent will use this. But it does sound like it's a really good solution for blocking ads. Oh yeah, I love it. Better they think than you block Origin or an ad, oh, ad gosh, blocker? Yes. Well, it's free. <laughs> yeah. If you've got a Raspberry Pi 2 or above, that should work. I probably wouldn't do this with a Raspberry One, um, just because you, then you are very far down on horsepower. But a two or a three will work fine. And I, actually, since the episode, I did notice this. I didn't have it on my version, but it does have a disable tab. So if you okay. are going to visit a site That's important. that you want to support. Slick deals. If you want to go to slick yeah. deals, it's blocked. You temporarily, for a minute or two, unblock 10 it. 10 seconds, 30 yeah. seconds, or okay. custom time. So okay. you, you can say, hey, for the next hour, I'm visiting sites that I actually want to support. I need their ads so that they can continue doing what they're doing. That's one reason I like an ad blocker. If I go to fortune.com and they say, hey, we see you're using an ad blocker, pretty please, yeah. would you unblock us? Because that's how we make money. And I want to be able to do that yeah. on that's, some sites. Not all sites, probably not fortune, but on many sites. Yeah. 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 But well, uh, so you can't do that with a pie hole very easily. Uh, I mean, you can turn it it's off. Not a, it's not. It's not as easy. Yeah. 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 Uh, also, well, if, uh, what I would suggest is when you set this up, because you want it for all the devices on your network, right? Yeah. So uh, I want it to uh, block ads. Uh, well, essentially through on, the, on my, my Mac and such on his Mac and his computer, but also um, non phones and such. So yeah, basically putting it through the router so that. Um, any anything on the network has has automatically has those ads blocked. Right. So what I would suggest is when you set it up on the, on the router, the router, which by the way, I love how you say that. Um, <laughs> what you want to do is use the primary as the address of your pie hole, but always enter in a secondary. And I would suggest 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 which is Google, or 28.67.222.222, which is Open DNS. Use that as a secondary, just in case your pie hole goes down. If for any reason it gets unplugged or it becomes unresponsive, if you don't have that, what's gonna happen is you will no longer have a DNS server. So if you have a secondary in there that you know will be up, like Google, then it just means if you see ads showing up, you have to go over to your data closet, unplug it, and reboot. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It sounds like a really interesting solution. It's very aggressive. It's aggressive, yes. And, and uh, uh, you are relying on these third parties to update these DNS tables. Yes. Are they the standard sub usual suspects? The kinds that uBlock Origin uses, or is this all done by the pie hole people? This is all done by the pie hole okay, people. Okay, so it's their choices about what to block and what Precisely. to block. Precisely. And uh, what I would say is this. If you're going to use this project, 
please consider throwing a little donation their way because they don't charge for the software. The script is literally one line that you run on a Pi and it's, it's good to go. Uh, so their server's getting hit a lot. They, well, I mean, yeah, they, they get hit for the bandwidth, and they also get hit because they have to update those subdomains because the ad right. providers are always playing that cat and mouse game. They'll change to a different subdomain or a different domain entirely. So throw, throw a buck or two their way and, and help them continue to develop this. But on the upside, when you use this, you can say things like, Shut your pie hole! Do they say that in the UK, shut your pie hole? Uh, no, no. <laughs> it sounds uniquely American. It. Yeah, yeah, it sounds wrong. unique. Appreciate That's where the name comes from. You can do some research. <laughs> Visit Urban Dictionary and it's find real. out. It's real. It's yeah. real. It's yeah. real. Hey, it's yeah. really nice to talk to you. I appreciate it, Will. No, thank you. It's, be, it's, it's good. And, you know, I've got uh, Raspberry Pi 2 that's just doing nothing in my kitchen. So yeah. it's something for me to play with him to play with exactly. him. Exactly. 20 yeah, minutes. might not keep it running. But uh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's literally one points. curl command. You yep. curl, you Down, curl the... Download the newest Raspbian. You can even get the light with the, without the GUI. Run the one curl command, and you're done. You have the IP address. You're good to go. And I and I like this where you see these. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see the there it is. When you see these curl commands, I like it. Whenever I see these on the net now, people say, you know, piping to bash can be dangerous. Yes, it can be. But I trust these people. But though. just They're do good it. People. <laughs> just do it. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> just running a script at random from the internet. Just, okay, what could possibly type it to go your wrong? computer, and then you can examine it before you run it. How yeah, about that's that? a good idea. Download it and run. Look at it first. Thank you, Will. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. Take care. Next week, Jason Howell will be here all about Android. We're going to look at the Google Pixel, the Pixel 2 XL. Mine comes on Monday, the Panda. Oh, I'm excited. Uh, and a lot more. But if you have a question about Android for our All About Android host, here's how you ask. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. All right, Dueling Geeks is coming up. Our, our holiday gift guide for travel gadgets. Padre and I will, will, will fight it off gadget by gadget. You can decide who the winner is. But first, I'm really excited about this. Megan Maroney earlier this week talked to America's top young scientist. She's 11. Watch. A lot of folks in tech these days say they're doing what they're doing to save lives and make the world a better place. But Gitanjali Rao really is and she's only 11 years old. Inspired by the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, Gitanjali created her own device that reduces the time of lead detection in water by using a mobile app to connect over Bluetooth to get the status of water almost immediately. Her invention recently also won her the 2017 Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge Award. Welcome to the show, Gitanjali. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us about your device. Yeah, so I developed a device to detect lead in water faster than the current techniques out there today. So you were inspired. You, you saw your parents uh, trying to test water. You're, you're not in Michigan. You're in Colorado. But your, yeah. your, your parents were testing the water. And, and what, what gave you the idea to create this device? I hadn't thought about creating a device until I saw my parents testing for lead in our water using test strips. And I realized that it wasn't a very reliable process as it took them quite a few tries in order to actually um, um, find out if our water was safe or not. So um, I wanted to do something to change this, not only for my parents, but for the residents of Flint and places like Flint around the world. It's pretty much just a blue box with a white cartridge which attaches and you just have to dip the cartridge in the water you wish to test. And it, it's called Tethys? Is that how you pronounce Te it? Tethys. And where yes. does the name come from? Yeah, it's the Greek goddess of fresh water. So I decided to give it a, a bit of a unique name. <laughs> so so you have an Arduino in there. Uh, where, did you do any testing with other with other parts first? What, what was part of your process? What did you try first? Um, well, first I started with um, the simple idea of... Um, just a device. I didn't have like the concept of carbon nanotubes or um, just the chemical reactions between lead and chloride, which is the base of my device. Um, I started out with just plain chemical reactions like we find in today's test strips. And then I started getting into the idea of displaying it on a mobile phone instead of using an LED system with red, yellow, and green lights. And when I tried to display it on a mobile phone, I was deciding between if I wanted to use an Arduino processor or um, a Raspberry Pi. 
Um, I thought that an Arduino processor would work better since um, I had more experience with coding Arduino processors. So those are kind of the steps I took in order to develop um, my conceptual idea. So you coded the app all by yourself? Yes, I did. How did you, did you what did you use to code, code the app? Um, I used the application called the MIT App Inventor software, and this allowed me to use a drag and drop code in order to connect over Bluetooth and the app itself and create a page where you could check your status and it would give you the status of slightly contaminated, um, safe or critical according to your water status. So obviously you are very intelligent, um, but I hear that you had a little help. Tell us about what, what kind of help, what uh, mentors you had with this project. Yeah, so um, once I was selected as a finalist, um, I was assigned a 3M scientist mentor. Um, my mentor was Dr. Kathleen Schaefer, and she helped me with more of my experimentation plans and helping me make sure that I have taken all like safety and disposal requirements into consideration in my project as well. And this ensures that, um, that I don't rush and go ahead and do the experiment before I, um, I have all the materials. So I read that your parents were also very helpful, but they, they thought that maybe you would just, you had this idea and maybe you would just um, try it for a while and it, the experience would be good. They, were, were they not, were they surprised that, that you were actually able to complete this? Um, yes, to an extent they were. Um, they did help me a lot with um, my like acquiring items that I needed and for transportation as well to like the science company where I received my chemicals. So they were a huge help in this journey. Okay, so you, you won $25,000. Uh, do you have any idea what you're gonna do with that money? Yeah, with most of the money, I plan to continue evolving my device so that it um, I can perform um, false positive tests in order to ensure that it's accurate. And then after that, I would like to put it out um, into the market as commercially available so that it can be in everyone's hands. So it sounds like the parts you use is probably wouldn't be very expensive to make and produce. Do you have any idea how much something like this might cost an average person to buy? An average person to buy, including the device itself and the cartridge, it would cost approximately $20. So what are, what are you working on next? Um, next, I would like to do something in the fields of gene editing, since that sounds like a, a very interesting topic to me. And something like a happiness detector as well, since um, uh, I know that adolescent depression is a pretty big thing out there today. And that's another real world problem that I want to tackle. So, so what advice, Katanjali, would you have for kids your age or even older or, or younger, uh, besides yeah. telling their parents to get them a science room? What, what kind of <laughs> advice would you have them uh, to, what, for them for their ideas? Something that I would tell anybody, um, including kids and adults, is to not be afraid to try. Since um, when I originally started coming up with scientific ideas um, and problems that I wanted to possibly find solutions to. Um, I was very worried that I would get to like this far of creating an idea and then not being able to perform any of the experiments since I didn't know how to do them. Um, so then I learned that failure is just another step to succeeding. And um, I like to tell many people that so that um, when they have an idea and they're not sure that if they can create it, it doesn't hurt to try at all. Um, and pretty much, I think that every problem in this world can be solved. Gitanjali, thank you so much for joining us. You're totally an inspiration. Gitanjali Rao is an almost 12, 12 year old. She's still 11 for nine more days. Uh, and she is the Discovery Education 3M Young Scientist Challenge Award winner. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> what were you like at 11? I was not like that. No, wow, that's so cool. She's it, 11 years old, she's trying to, tr to tackle adult depression. Yeah. That's amazing. Brilliant, brilliant kid. And uh, it, it, what, a couple of things come to mind. One is, this is how kids are before they get squashed down by us adults. Right. So th that's awesome. Uh, and kudos to her parents, but also kudos to a 3M uh, for, and Discovery for doing this uh, young scientist 
uh, thing. That's fantastic. That and is, and that, that line about how, well, she was worried about not being able to do proper scientific experimentation. I'm thinking, okay, when I was 11 years old, I was thinking, will this gum stick to my hair? Yeah, that was it, right? <laughs> so let's find out. Uh, oh, how about that? <laughs> isn't, isn't she impressive? Isn't that a, that's so I, exciting. I, I, it's so cool. Well, you, you didn't see it, folks, but while we were watching the video, Lee and I were just... I couldn't guy, believe it. I couldn't believe this. And, I mean, this is why kids should not be allowed to play video games. Yes. Uh, <laughs> That's what, that's what happens when you get something done. <laughs> this is what happens when you play video games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Megan. Megan recommended that. And I'm so glad she got, uh, she got uh, Gitanjali. And uh, what, a, what an impressive, impressive young woman. Uh, time for our gift guide. We've been doing these all month long. We've got more to come. Holiday gift giving. Today, Father Robert and I are going to share some tips because we both travel a lot. You we spend do. a lot of time traveling. I, I'm in planes and in cars pretty much, uh, but probably half of my life. And I love to travel. And so uh, both of us went to our back catalogs. <laughs> we did. Uh, have you noticed we, we do tend to have a big warehouse of yeah, stuff? Yeah, Well, uh, mine's not that big. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is unfair. Anthony told me to bring in a bag. <laughs> A bag, not a basket. This is my travel basket. <laughs> so you, you go through TSA with that? Yeah, no, no. But there there are things in here that, I, oh, everything in here I've gone through TSA uh, with. They're all safe. Should you, you want to start or shall I start? Uh, you, why don't you kick it off? Well, I'll start with something uh, simple. How about that? A cable. How about that? So this these actually go together. Uh, one of the things that's important for me is keeping all my stuff charged. Of course. And I have tried a variety of devices uh, this is a, uh, you probably have something similar. This comes from iClever. They do a lot of interesting I like things. This. this is called their like boost this. strip. So you have one plug. This, of course, you'll put an adapter on, not a transformer, because almost all my stuff handles all voltage, 110 and 220, 240. But you will put that, uh, you know, an adapter to plug into the one socket that you have. Many hotel rooms, that's all you get. And it gives you three more sockets, US style sockets. And I really like this with an on off switch. Uh, I don't know why, but I feel like that's a nice feature. And then there are four high-power USB Ooh. ports. Again, they have their own on and off switch as well. The, uh, the ports are a total of 25 watts divided among four. So you could have, say, for instance, charge you know uh, an iPad mm -hmm. if you plugged in one. And then I bring, instead of bringing different cables these for are different important. things. These are important. I have these. I love these. These are, I think Andy Anako recommended them. They're Nomad cables. They're very good braided cables. They have a five-year warranty. I like braided cables. They don't tangle as easily. They're tough. But this one cable has all three of the major connectors oh, you need. Like so it starts, of course, with a micro USB. I still have a few things that need micro USB. But you can put on top of it either a Type-C or a Lightning charger. And, and this, is, this is MFI compatible, so it means that you could use it uh, on all to charge. And if you have, if you use all 25 watts, off of this, you could quick charge your iPhone 10, your iPhone 8, or your uh, iPad with this. And so having the right cable, it, what you need is four of these, so that you're ready for all occasions. And this iClever, the iClever uh, power, I mean, I have the prices here, I should just give it to you. It's $19 for their Boost Strip Portable. These aren't cheap uh, cables, these universal cables, they start about 30 bucks. Well, you could buy a $30 cable, or you could buy... $10, a, a $5 ten, yeah, cable. Exactly. So, <laughs> The app, my experience with Apple cables is they're not very good. They fall apart. Yeah, this is a Type A USB, uh, so it's mostly for charging. It's not so much for, but yeah, I guess you could connect it to a uh, Type A USB uh, laptop and uh, do the syncing thing. As By well. the way, that is a great way to make friends when traveling. If you're ever in an airport and uh, you you plug notice this that in. everyone is delayed, plug this. You in. plug that in, and everyone wants to be your friend. Yeah, keep this in your carry-on because that is actually very yeah. very useful. Yeah. All right, your turn. All right, well let's let's stay with the power theme. What do I have power-wise? Okay, I got this. I got this. Same idea. Yeah. You know, I, I want to travel, but I want to keep everything charged up. So I brought this. Now this... I love Anchor stuff, and I actually have a bunch of these. Yeah, this is the Anchor. This is a premium 60-watt wall charger, so it's AC and on one side, of course, it'll do 110, 220 if you do, do your international standard. But on the other side, I've started making the switch to USB-C. Mm -hmm. So my laptop, my phone, they're all USB-C. This will do 60 watts either through the C port or through any of these. So this will That's fast charge lot. your tablets. Wow. Yeah, 60 watts for this, this tiny little thing. Unlike yours, it doesn't have uh, additional AC plugs, so it, you know I can't share it that way. But I wanted something small and something that would be able to charge this. Now, this we've seen before. This is also an Anchor product. This is their power core. I love this thing. Oh. 26800. 
Now, the nice thing about this is uh, it takes like 30 hours to charge this. Because <laughs> it's how many how many watts? Uh, it's a milliamp what, hours. Uh, Twenty six thousand eight hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's got a lot of power in there. So this will charge your MacBook. It will charge your laptop. All the way it will charge up. All the way up multiple times. Yeah. And you combine these two. That's a This nice will fast charge this. Yeah. And then this can fast charge all your devices when you're on the go. Uh, now the the uh, the wall charger is going to be about 50 bucks. The power cord, depending on where you get it and whether or not you want another adapter with it, is going to be between 60 and 80 dollars. But this this is with me all the time. I mean, they're they're a little bit roughed up now because they've traveled around the world with me. But I, I don't need anything else. This is all my power needs. Let's talk about once we get on the plane. All right. Yeah. Gotta listen to music. I hate to hear babies cry. <laughs> so always, this is my kit. All right, this is my audio kit. Now, of course, many of you are gonna use your iPhone for music, but I don't like to deplete my phone, so this is like an iPod. Uh, it actually is a high-res audio player. I'll take the, uh, the rubber sleeve off. It's kind of pretty. Uh, we reviewed this some time ago. It's the FIO, F-I-I-O. And this is one of the reasons you have a micro USB <laughs> charger. But this will go about 15, 20 hours. This will go in a long intercontinental flight. And then I, I end up with my uh, phone fully charged because I haven't been draining it listening to music. But what do you plug into it? Well, it's got a headphone jack, so that's a nice start. Um, I, the, a lot of people love the uh, noise-canceling headphones. I don't bring those big... Bose Quiet Comforts with me. They're too yeah. big. But these are the QC30s. These are the over the ear. They go in the ear. And they have active noise cancellation. This is from Bose. These are about $300. They're not, they're not cheap. You have to charge this up also. And once you turn it on, it's going to have active noise cancellation. Notice I've always got my special lightning mm -hmm. adapter. You got to have that for your iPhones. But this is another thing the kit's really great for. It has all the other weird adapters too. You know, like those strange two-prong adapters you find on some older planes, things like that. So there's nothing I can't use these headphones with. And I even bring with me replacements for the ear filters and so forth. Because to be honest, I don't like noise canceling headphones as much as in-ear monitors that seal the ear. These are etymotics. And frankly, this is my headphone. Oh, Adam are fantastic. These are the, these are the uh, ER uh, 4XP. They're kind of the top of the line. These are fairly expensive, I think three or four hundred bucks, but very, very good audio quality. And you don't have to worry about noise in the plane with these because they go so deep in your ear canal that you can't hear anything. The problem with noise canceling headphones is they actually don't work against internet and noises like babies crying. They only right. work against, against jet noise and continuous noise. So if there's a crying baby, you gotta have your etymotics here. So this is my sound kit. There's a whole variety of etymotics. You can even use them, and as I do, as a wired uh, 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 headphones for your phone, so you can use it as a speaker phone. Uh, and they even have, I like this, if you go to the bottom there, a kid's version that limits how loud they can go. Those are only $45. That's actually really important. Isn't that nice? I used to think that was a gimmick, but oh, you know, no. it, makes, it makes sense because you can damage your kid's ears very so easily. easily. I have tinnitus. Uh, my, my ears ring 24-7. And uh, it's because when I was a kid, I listened to really loud, I loved loud rock and roll music. Don't let your kids do that. It's very bad for them. Yeah. So that's my that's my audio kit, all of that stuff. Now, I, I didn't want to bring in just my audio kit because I've used the Audio-Technica ANC-9s for a while. They're over the ear. Which, I have those too. They're also uh, yeah. noise canceling. They're I, very nice. I, I yeah. like them just because uh, the earbud, for me, if they're I'm more like comfortable for long -term. Precisely. If I'm yeah. on a 12-hour flight, the earbuds will just start irritating on my On the ears. other hand, with the earbuds, if you're sleeping, you can True. sleep on a pillow. True. You can't with big headphones on. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I kind of do this thing where I surround myself, so I'm just kind of pushed back into the seat. So that's, But my objective when I get into a plane is to be annoying. Um, <laughs> and so I brought something that would help me do that uh, with this. Oh, my God. This is amazing. I just bought this. Okay, so, you know. I some, haven't set it up yet. Some people might say, hey, you know, I want to watch a movie on my laptop. No, I'm going to watch it on the roof of the plane. <laughs> this, this is a this is a portable projector. This is a portable projector, and it is actually quite amazing. This is called the Mars Nebula. It's by Anchor. It's a it's a, uh, a co-op between that battery company and and uh, it's Mars. It's not cheap. Six hundred bucks. Six hundred bucks, but it's the equivalent of three thousand lumen. Notice, by the way, it's on. Yep. But it's not plugged in. 
No, no. It's a big old battery. That's it's one a of the reasons huge it's battery. Three yeah. hour battery. It will do 1280 by 800, but it will scale down larger resolutions. It's a 19,500 milliamp hour battery. So again, that's three hours. Wireless connectivity. Uh, so it's 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth 4.0, which also means that I can do things like airplaying to it or Netflix. casting to it. Yeah, it has apps. It, you know, you, I can Android. use Netflix on this. It is Android. It weighs less than five pounds and uh, has a remote. However, Leo, if you want to be truly, truly yeah, annoying. The plain ceiling is a little curved. Yeah, a little I, curved. I really wish we had a screen with Oh, us. so, you know, I kind of, I like to do <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> So, you know, you How put, big is that screen? So, 26 inches. Uh, this is a 3M uh, projector screen. I've had this thing for a couple of you years You don't now. really get on a plane, unload this, set the projector <laughs> up, and watch a movie. Oh, do you? you don't know. <laughs> it could be. I, but, I mean, this thing is pretty amazing. Let's see. Let's see. And, you know, of course, we've got studio lighting on right yeah. now. But, but that's uh, 3,000 lumens, you said? 3,000 lumens. That's very bright. Yeah, it's very, yeah. very bright. It will do auto skew. So, if, you know, if you start tilting, this actually figures out. Wow. Did you see that? It went from keystone yep. to straight. Yep. So, it, it, wow. it keystones itself, depending on the, how it's tilted. And, uh, you know, if you've ever used a Android TV, that's what this, uh, this is using. Uh, and altogether, this gives you a very nice way to get a 26-inch high-definition monitor anywhere you go. Another thing that will make you popular at air sports, just take over the yoga room. <laughs> and, no, no. And say, it's movie time. <laughs> In SFO, they now have the pet relaxation room. Pet? Pet relaxation. Pet? Yes. For I'm, pets? For pets. Mm. Mm -hmm. I need a relaxed pet. <laughs> so once you get to your destination... There are a number of things you're going to want to do. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Before we get off the plane, I should mention the. Oh, uh, yeah. this is Naturally. the Kindle. Yes. And, and uh, I do like it that you can now read your Kindle even while the plane is taking off. For a long time, a Kindle was kind of a nutty ID. This is the newest Kindle, the Kindle Oasis. It's not cheap. Ooh. 250 bucks. 300 DPI. Oops, I turned it off and on again. Look how thin it is, how light it is. The battery is in this wedge at the side. I would say the left-hand side, except... You can have it on either side you want. It you, rotates. I have forgotten how nice e-ink is. E-ink is so crisp. Now, I made the text pretty big so you can see it. They've also really improved the page turn on the Kindles. This is the fastest Kindle. And remember how the Kindle used to have that weird flicker when you turned pages? Not anymore. It is really uh, They've easy. They've got that tech down. It has physical buttons, but it also has a smart screen. So you can go back and forth. And this new Oasis has one other little cool feature. It supports Audible books. So it has enough memory. I got the 32 gig version. No. That's a lot of books, 32 gig. You really wouldn't need that for just books. But I also have uh, Audible library on here. Now, there's here's the negative. I was actually quite disappointed. And I'll, I'll show you. That's got to kill the battery. Uh, it doesn't. The battery life is remarkable because it is a fairly big battery. This will go weeks, not days. And if you turn off the Wi-Fi even longer, I haven't charged this thing in quite some time. But let me go to my library and I'll show you. You can see not only all of your uh, book books, but you can see all your Audible uh, books as well. But the negative is uh -oh. you don't have a headphone jack. So it's only Bluetooth. Oh. Which means you can pair it to Bluetooth speakers, that Fugu that you have. I love that Fugu. I love that. Yeah. I can pair it to that, and then I can listen, uh, not on an airplane. Um, and the one reason I really thought this was going to be cool, Amazon has an immersive reading technology where you're reading the text of a book and listening to it at the same time, and it, it's like karaoke. It highlights oh. the text. I really was looking forward to that. Unfortunately, this doesn't, unaccountably, frankly, this doesn't support it. So you, e you either listen and you're in the audible interface or you're reading. You can't do both. Uh, I figure that's a firmware upgrade that uh, Amazon could make. Amazon, I want to urge you to make this really a high recommendation. That's just software. They it, can fix it, that. it needs the immersive uh, reading capability. Then I'd be very excited. But this is the new Oasis. It is easily the best Kindle ever. And if you're still a Kindle user, uh, especially if you have Kindle Unlimited, which means you have hundreds of books you can listen to, uh, more than that, uh, for free or for a flat fee. This is really a great way to read. I turn the light down fairly low, and I can read in bed without bothering uh, my wife at all uh, as I'm reading in bed. So I like having a Kindle with me. Yeah, I, I took to reading back on a tablet again. and uh, It's okay, it, but it's, it's harder it's on harder. the eyes. It is yeah. much harder. This you can read. I mean, it's just really... You can read in the sun. You can be at the beach. Yeah. You just pull it out, and Oh, it's I fun. forgot to mention, you can be at the beach because this yeah. is the first waterproof Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> can I read it underwater? Uh, you can read it in the tub. Uh, <laughs> mm. Well, not in the tub. Okay, near the tub. Yeah, if right. near the... You wouldn't want to... <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I wouldn't. I, would, I wouldn't read. Underwater. I had that problem with that uh, the um, the Google Watch yeah. that I inherited from you. Yeah, uh, it's water what resistant. To it? Yeah, it's, it's, it, water resistant <laughs> is a very subjective term. Yeah, resistant doesn't resistant. mean impermeable. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, that's still on the airplane, but we'll get off the airplane in a second. Do you have anything else for the airplane? No, you know, I I think that uh, that's about as annoying as I can get on an airplane. Okay. Yeah. Can Protect you annoy me in the hotel room? I I can probably annoy you. Do you, you have in the anything else? Do you run out? No, no, I've got a couple stuff. Oh, shoot, yeah, I, I thought I won. Oh, although, because I <laughs> mean... Because I am not even close. They did tell me, they said, look, bring like three or four things. <laughs> so, but I should have Leoized it. Ah, <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay, now, one of the things that bothers a lot of people, especially on the newer notebooks, so yeah. uh, my new um, Spin 7 from Acer or, or a MacBook, is the fact that you typically have one, maybe two USB-C ports. That can be a problem if you're traveling. So what I thought is, maybe we should show off a couple of portable docks. Docks are great. I love docks. And these are two of my favorite. One of them is from OWC, so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big Mac company. And this one is from Anchor. Now, the whole idea about this is I take a single USB-C connection, and it gives me everything I might need to replicate. So on the uh, OWC, I'm going to have 60-watt pass-through, this, uh, this one right here. This is going to have 60-watt pass-through, uh, so I, I put my uh, USB-C charger there, and I can charge as I'm using the functions of the dock. It's got a card reader. It's uh, got two USB uh, 3.0 ports. Great. And then it's got HDMI 2.0. See, this solves a big problem because the Macintosh just doesn't have enough. It doesn't, ports. right? And so this solves that. Yeah, problem. and and hanging dongle after dongle yeah. after dongle, that's not cool. This will give you everything in one spot. Now, this is about fifty dollars. This is a fantastic. That's not bad. Card. No, a card reader, a good USB C, yeah. uh, you know, type type three card reader would be cost you that much. That's yeah. a good price. And and uh, what I really like about this is it will work on Mac. It will work on uh, PC. So it's 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 standards based. Now, uh, I also have this, this uh, anchor, because sometimes I want all those functions, but I also want this. This Ethernet. is big for me. Ethernet. Yeah. Uh, that's, I, I mourn the loss of Ethernet off of modern notebooks. Yeah. Uh, so this does all the same things. 60 watt pass through, it's got an SD card reader, it's got HDMI 2.0, it's got two USB 3.0 ports, but the addition of that Ethernet port means that's one less thing that I have to have that's in nice. my bag. Yep. This will go for about $70, super simple devices, and a uh, the other advantage of this is this will also work on Chromebooks. Um, I haven't been able to get the OWC to work on a Chromebook. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I, 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 there it's might be something. Issue. Yeah, just yeah. a driver issue. How about Windows machines? Windows, PC, okay. Chromebook, no problem. Okay, Chromebook yeah. is the issue. Um, I've shown this before. I love this uh, for just kind of keeping your your wires. Oh, yes. This is the gridded, and it really is great. These are little uh, rubbery, uh, and so it is a, 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 a single sheet that's kind of stiffed. See, this one even has a zipper pouch. And then you slide the wires and cables. You see I have Ethernet, I have cables, and so forth. One thing I have in here, though, is a must-have as you travel. And this is a tiny hardware firewall. This is the newest tiny oh, hardware. We've those. talked about this yes. before, right? This comes from Wi-Fi Consulting, a Washington, D.C.-based VPN. They, they do hotspot VPN. And that's really the only negative on the hardware firewalls you get from them. We've talked about this before. You could make your own or buy them from another company that will let you choose VPNs. But this you have to use either their hotspot VPN or this one uses their black cloud VPN, which is cool because it's a Docker, I think container-based VPN. You're the only user on the VPN, so you get very good throughput. What I like about this one is uh, this, do, this appears as an Ethernet, a, a USB Ethernet adapter. So almost everything supports an right. Ethernet adapter via USB. That's all you need is a driver. It has two Wi-Fi radios built in. So you'll plug this into your laptop, connect the Wi-Fi radio to the Wi-Fi access point in your hotel or the coffee shop. If it's one of those captive portals, it has a little workaround that lets mm -hmm. you use a captive portal. It can uh, spoof a MAC address. So you'll join the captive portal on your laptop and then sign out, effectively signing in, and then assign your MAC address to this device. And so most captive portals will think you've already logged in and let you use the tiny hardware firewall on the captive portal. But it also has a second radio in there. So you can power it. You could even plug this into one of those big batteries you have to power it. And you can use their Wi-Fi right. in and Wi-Fi out and make this an access That's point as well. A, well I, that becomes my portable router. Exactly. I love that. So it's a router. Yeah. You can turn on the f VPN or not, by the way. You can just use it in router mode. And it also has Tor built in. So if you really want anonymity, you could have VPN Tor. And yes, ad blocking. It's kind of like a mini pie hole as well. What I like about this is when you showed it to me last time um, we were on a TNSS, 
we tested the speed, and it really doesn't seem to be the the bottleneck. It's pretty good. It's actually it's really, pretty good. Really it's good. you. Let's put it this way: all VPNs slow you down a little bit, but it's yeah. usable, and that's I think that's credit to the black hole firewall. Should I do a couple more oh, things? Oh gosh, yes. Let's let's. This keep it one going. is really important. <laughs> it's simple Wait, though. It's not high tech. It's for weighing your luggage. Oh. I, now, there's a lot of these. OMG Chad gave me this. I'm serious about that is worth its weight in gold. It is, because nowadays, nowadays uh, they really they charge you. Charge you, And if you go over 50 pounds, so, you know, the airline's going to charge you 35 bucks or more. Some airlines, even your uh, carry-on has to be to weight. So this measures in both kilograms and pounds, and it's very easy. You just put the... Yeah, there you go. That's this is one of them. There are many of these. Ten dollars, uh, but the, you put the luggage handle on there. You hold it, <laughs> and it will weigh the luggage. Here, just hold on, and I'll weigh you. No, no, <laughs> I don't think it'll take that much. As I go through the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this, here's the thing. This is not just a way to avoid fees. This yeah. is a way for you to avoid that embarrassing moment oh, where you're I in know. an international uh, uh, airport. Sure. Opening up your luggage to transfer, transfer items. Exactly. That is horrible. Don't do that, folks. Just carry this. And I truthfully, I should be wearing my Scotty vest because that's the trick uh, in that case is you have one of the no. Scotty vests with 27 pockets and you just take I stuff out of your luggage. <laughs> Don't let them see you do that. And you load it up I've and got, you got a 40 yeah. pound vest on. I've gotten to the point where I'm like, Walking like this because I've got all my heavy but they, items. But in my then jacket. when you get to the conveyor belt, you put it on the yeah. conveyor belt and Done. they never complain. I don't know why. They ought to. It's crazy. Um, more? Do you have Yeah, something? well, you know what? We both have this. Oh, we, we both, both have like this. this. Yours is in the package. Mine's, Mine's in the out. package because I've got a couple of these. Uh, these Joby Gorilla Pods. Love them. Uh, I mean, it's and it's not just for cameras. I will hang lights off of this. I will use it for the projector. I use the magnetic attachment all the time. Yeah, these feet are magnetic. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is one of these things where you don't think about it until it becomes incredibly useful. And the ability to hang anything pretty much anywhere makes it something that you absolutely want in your travel kit. Now, this is a standard uh, thread for a tripod, but you can also get a uh, little, uh, you've got it in here, yeah. Yeah. the little um, clamp that lets you, uh, oh, we should mention Joby is a sponsor. I forgot about that. Yeah. We've been using these since long before Joby, but this clamp lets you use any smartphone, as you can see. With this, and they have different sizes. This is perfect for this Yi action cam. Yi, I like these. Yi yeah. is interesting. It's a Chinese company that uh, is basically competing with GoPro, but they're much less expensive. This is a 4K camera. It, uh, you know, it starts at 70 bucks. Um, you can go uh, more expensive, of course, but it's both stills, wide, very wide angle, like a GoPro. Uh, ever since Jerry rode over my GoPro with a truck, I had to get this. And <laughs> I'm actually very happy. And I guess if you're bringing the Yi, you should also have a selfie stick. Oh, this I like. you got to have a selfie stick. This is actually a ridiculously expensive selfie stick because it has a Bluetooth trigger. It, has, it, it goes out very far. It has a standard threading and all that stuff. So this is, this is more than... You know, this is more than an average selfie stick. This is like, you know, you can buy well, I kind of want it weighted a bit more so this you is, could, feel you that. could use it's it as a, an asp. You, you could hit people with that. Yeah, you could, uh, yeah. Which, which you do. This is why they're banned from, like, the Louvre. Because <laughs> they don't want you smacking in the people. But, you know, Leo, this is kind of nice, but what I was hoping you would have in your bag is is maybe something that could help me steady my shots as I'm moving. Oh, I do have something uh, you could vacation. steady your shots. This is great. Now, I don't, I don't know if I'll always bring this, but if you know that you're going to be doing video on your travels, this is fantastic. From the DJI folks, it's called the Osmo. It's a gimbal. It's a rechargeable gimbal. You put your phone in that clamp there, and it supports iPhones, Android phones. It doesn't really matter. The only key with putting your phone in is not to do it that way. You have to put it so that the camera is not oh, right. locked. Okay. <laughs> I, I've I don't, learned I this. Don't, I don't do this texting, I've learned this Leo. with hard experience because I've shot stuff and there's... What's that? What's that big black? Th oh, <laughs> That's darn it. I put uh, it in wrong. Got it. Uh, and, but it balances very quickly. And one of the problems with gimbals is uh, most gimbals, you spend a lot of time adjusting and balancing. Right, right. This one works very, very uh, easily, very simply. Let me make sure it's in here. I don't so want to drop clamp, your clamp beautiful in. phone. There, you go. there we go. We tighten it down. All right. And I'll turn it on. And it has lots of nice uh, controls. You're familiar with the iPhone. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. So um, it, will hold the, it will hold the camera steady. 
but you can also uh, aim it you can direct and it. direct it. You can lock it in place and then move around and it will keep it fixed on this somewhere. This is the coolest thing to take on a vacation if you want to do, do a lot of video. Yeah, you have you to know the lighting shots. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It's not cheap either, $300, but it's the best gimbal I've ever had. It's the easiest uh, to use. And unfortunately, it does have proprietary charging. So when you use oh. this gimbal, you got to remember to do what I didn't do. I got a second battery, but I forgot to bring the cable. You got to bring your cable because it's a proprietary uh, you know, connector. With USB-C providing so much power these days, everything's got to go to that. Well, I, I don't know why yeah. anyone would make anything that's not USB-C these days. But this is really this is the I've tried a lot of gimbals. Uh, this is easily the easiest one, the best one to use. I, I was I've been able to have people use this with with, with about five minutes of training, right, uh, right. which is nice. It's got all the buttons you need right where you want them to be. The trigger locks it into place. You can steer it, uh, go up and down. It's really a fantastic gimbal from uh, DJI. Same technology as in their Phantom, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, a handheld gimbal. Yeah, like they it, basically just took the gimbal off the quadcopter, put a handle on right. it. Right. There you go. Right. Yeah. The quadcopter is quite good. Now, Leo, I did want to give a couple of lower price sort of practical items because this is sort of, you know, we've been doing a lot of geeky stuff. Not everyone's going to be carrying around a $600 projector no, or a $100 no, no, screen no. or, you know, a firewall. However, everyone is going to be at some point in a hotel or an unfamiliar home and you're going to want to get things onto the TV. Now, you could bring a bunch of cables or if, if you're I in my this. environment... You bring this with you. Uh, I've got a Chromecast. So and I, smart. I've also got the Windows equivalent. So I've got two devices that will wirelessly allow me to push anything from my phone or my laptop to any HDMI device. And, uh, you know, these have become so inexpensive over the last couple of years that it doesn't make sense not to have one of these in your kit. Uh, the other, the, what I consider the companion to that is, and you've seen me use these before, I now have like 30 of these things. These are the uh, the Kingston USB-C <laughs> duos. Uh, and again, Very handy. I've started switching over to USB-C. So on one side, I've got USB 3.0. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And on the other side, it's USB-C. And what that means is that this one device will plug into my phone, it will plug into my laptop, it will plug into that projector. It supports USB to, to go. To go, right, nice. yeah. So, I mean, Very it's, nice. it's, 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 uh, these are perfect companions. I can have a single drive that has all of my media. I can play it on my laptop, I can play it on my desktop, I can play it through the Chromecast, or I can push it to the projector. So, you know, this is sort of like a, you know, definitely have it in the back of the bag type items. And not expensive. These go every, anywhere from $15 up to about $30 if you want to go between 32 and 64 gigs. Could I, should I do one or two let's, more? Yeah, Are you done? Uh, I'm done. Let's throw out some more though, Leo. Come on. <laughs> okay. It's hard to choose. I so many. All right. It's got to go to the Because of our last segment, I think this is actually a very important oh, thing. Oh, yes. This is called the Steri Pen. And this is kind of an amazing device. And actually, I did not put this in the rundown. But this is something that every traveler should have with them. You can use this to sterilize <laughs> water. So if you're in a country where you don't trust the drinking water, mm -hmm. uh, or you're on a hike and you want to drink some pond scum, this thing... Will, this is a UV, it's not a filter, it's a UV sterilizer. It has a pretty clear instructions. I'm not going to do it right now because I, I don't want to blind anybody. But you put this in the water, mm -hmm. you stir it around, it takes about a minute, and that will kill all microorganisms in the water and make it safe to drink. And I know many people, it's really most useful if you're going to a country where you're not sure if the water's safe. Yep. And there are a lot of places where you go where you could drink bottled water, but if you can't get bottled water, it's really nice to have the ability uh, to sterilize that water. So, and, and I know these work 100% because you do. A, a few years back on Know How, we tested a UVC phone sterilizer and we thought it was kind of a gimmick, right. but then we actually did oh, a really bacterial culture. Yeah. And 100% made an incredible difference. And this will do up to a liter at a time. So if you have a liter bottle, you could put this in here and stir it. And you stir for a period, you know, period of time, and everything will be clean. And that's really a very handy thing to do if you're and you, traveling. You in countries do travel where, the places where occasionally, you know, there are countries where you, you know, yeah. it's 89.95. Uh, actually, want to thank a, a listener who sent me this because I was talking about this. If, well, I'll tell you how it came up. I was talking with Johnny Jet. Uh, who and the number of people said this said don't drink hot beverages on an airplane because they don't necessarily clean the uh, containers uh, there there uh. have been known breakouts of diseases from coffee and tea on an airplane that water is not boiling when they're making the coffee and tea and the water on the airplane is stored in 
you know, uh, tanks, that, tanks that yeah. are not necessarily that clean. So oh, I, I, we were talking about this, and, I, and, I, and somebody said, well, I, whenever I'm on an airplane, if I'm going to drink hot beverages, I bring my SteriPen, and I, and I sterilize uh, the water. SteriPen Traveler, it's very, you see it's compact. It comes with a little uh, carrying case, uses standard batteries, easy to replace. Uh, that is a nice thing to have if you're going somewhere exotic or just on an airplane. Now, Leo, we didn't go too crazy. We didn't have anything that was ridiculous. Uh, but I will have to say, you know, I think you win this round. I don't know. That Nebula uh, uh, projector and the screen, I think the screen. Well, the screen, well, the screen's just <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, this, seriously. let's call this one a tie. The, next, the next time you go to a family that reunion and special. you do that. And yeah, you just put this that's down. That's pretty special. That's uh, that's a special moment. There are a lot of things that uh, we frequent flyers uh, carry with us on our travels. I hope you found something interesting. Any of these would be a great gift, and, and there's a big, pretty big range from twenty dollars to yep. six hundred dollars mm -hmm. uh, of things that uh, you can use. So I hope you enjoyed our our holiday gift guide. But we're not done. No, no, we're not done because Tim Stevens, as you know. He's quite the car f a fanatic. He works over at CNET, and we asked him on the road show, and we asked him if he could give us his top picks. Now, this would be a great gift for vehicles. Watch. <laughs> I'm Tim Stevens, Editor-in-Chief of Roadshow by CNET, and if you have someone special in your life and you're looking to put a new set of wheels for them this holiday season, here are six choices in different categories that I think would be a good pick. We'll start with the EV category. If you want something emissions-free, my pick would be the Chevrolet Bolt. Starting at about $37,000, you can actually get it for just about $30,000 with the federal rebate. And depending on what state you live in, you can actually save even a couple thousand dollars more. This is a great EV because it's just a really nice, practical family car. Seats five comfortably, has plenty of room for cargo in the back, and you can get well over 200 miles of range on a single charge. It's rated for 238 miles, and I've done even more than that on one charge. That's pretty impressive. I know what you're probably wondering. What about the Tesla Model 3? Well, I think you would have had to be a really, really good boy or girl to find one of those this year because they are still in very limited production. And they're really hard to find. If you want something more in a family sedan, my pick there would be the 2018 Honda Accord, which is just coming to market now. Starting at about $23,000, Honda has a couple of new turbocharged engines with the base being a 1.5 liter turbo paired with the CVT. That'll do 38 miles per gallon on the highway. Doesn't have the most power, but Honda has made the new Accord a lot more engaging to drive. It's the most fun to drive family sedan on the market. It's good to have a little bit of fun when you're taking the kids to school in the morning. If you need some more cargo space, my recommendation there would be the Ford F-150. Now, the current segment of trucks that we see is really competitive, and frankly, they're all really good. But if you're looking for technology and a good blend of both fuel economy and also cargo capacity, my pick there would be the F-150, starting at about $27,000. But you can go way, way, way up from there if you add on all the different sorts of technology that's available, things like adaptive cruise and keyless entry and all the other goodies that you might want. But again, all those are available in the F-150 and some of the competition like the Silverado is still lacking a lot of that stuff. If you want something a little bit more luxurious on the SUV side, let's say, my pick there would be the Volvo XC90. This is a big, luxurious, comfortable SUV, a three-row SUV. It doesn't have the most engaging driving dynamics. It's not the quickest SUV out there but it is one of the most comfortable with a beautiful, sumptuous interior and all sorts of technology to keep you safe and to keep you connected with, with both Android Auto and Apple CarPlay available inside. If you want something sportier, my choice is the Ford Mustang Shelby GT350R. This is not the quickest sports car in the world and at $62,000, it's more than twice the cost of the base Mustang, but that 5.2 liter V8 flat plane crank engine sounds absolutely incredible. And if you can get it to the track, I guarantee you are going to have an incredible time. It looks really good in yellow too. But finally, if you've got somebody in your life that was really good and you've got that Wall Street bonus check that you're about ready to cash, the only choice is the Bugatti Chiron. This car has 1,500 horsepower. It'll do more than 260 miles an hour and all the while to keep you comfortable in one of the most incredible interiors on the market. The cost there, a mere $3 million worth absolutely every penny. That's it. Those are my top six picks for cars for this holiday season. We've got four reviews of all those at Roadshow. Check us out over at theroadshow.com. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tim Stevens. Wow, that Bugatti Chiron. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's a buy-it-now item on Amazon. <laughs>
I was thinking, well, how much could that be? A, a couple hundred thousand? Three million dollars! Oh, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. <sighs> oh. Okay. We can dream. It kind of puts our travel gadgets in perspective. Yeah, we can dream. Yeah, that made us look cheap, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah at any price. Thank you, Tim. It's always great to have Tim Stevens on. It is time for the mailbag. Would you like to answer some more questions? Yeah, let's do that. Send in the mailbag! Boy, we never had this on the old screensavers. What an improvement. And by the way, huh. I don't know what this is, uh, but it looks pretty exciting. Uh, oh, wow. Where did you find this? You know, as Douglas Adams said, the most important travel item you can have oh, is your towel. And if you're going to go traveling with a towel, <laughs> amaze yourself. Jerry, is this from your collection? You know, the wow. sad thing is, Leo, back when I was still watching uh, the, the screensavers on the old tech TV, this would have been a beach towel, but now this is more of just a bath towel for me. <laughs> this is awesome. Well, put this somewhere safe. This is a we collector's item. Yeah, this is a real collector's item. A lot of that old ZDTV memorabilia was on eBay uh, initially, but I'm glad you I'm glad you did not sell this. A few years and back, and apparently I, have never were, used it either. Yeah. People had your shirts on eBay. What? I, I, I did a Leo Laporte search on eBay, and people had shirts that Leo wore on screensavers. Like, how did you get those? Okay, so that confirms it, John. <laughs> Someone stole his wardrobe. Well, I, you know, I have, uh, I have uh, closets full of the old shirts. We saved them all. And at Wait. one point, well, the books, I understand. Those things are worth, but that's, I'll sell them to you for a quarter. But... Uh, I I couldn't I I, th I thought that there were fewer shirts than before. So, yeah. So somebody must, must disappeared. Have raided my probably closet. at a Christmas party or two. I have this is this is uh, I think this might be a screensaver shirt. I have a lot of those old screensaver shirts. Uh, the, the one you haven't worn in a while is the Shinobi one. I love the Shinobi one. I have that. That's a great. You want me to wear Shinobi? Yeah. All right, next time you're on, there remind me. I have the Shinobi. It's in my closet. I'll take this one. Meanwhile, time to answer some questions. This is number one. Hey guys, from Anthony. Is this you, Anthony? I'm having a heck of a time figuring out what computer monitor I should buy ah. to be compatible with my Xbox One X. Oh. Ah. Mo computer monitor, he says. I didn't want to spend a ton. I bought a Samsung UE590. I thought the UHD was HDR10. No. It's uh, Dolby Vision, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What computer monitor can I buy that fully supports the Xbox One X video, says Anthony. Fortunately, this is a point of confusion because at CES 2017, a lot of manufacturers, Dell, Acer, Asus, LG, they all jumped in and they said, we're going to make HDR computer monitors, but that also meant there was a bunch of standards that were being thrown out on how you make that work properly for the, the computer world. And there are HDR monitors, but then there are HDR monitors. And he's yeah. asking about HDR10. It's very, very possible that you buy a, a monitor that's rated for HDR, but it doesn't support what the best standard is right now. Which is Dolby Vision. Which, which yeah, exactly. I I thought that the uh, the Xbox did support HDR10. I may be wrong on that, but I thought the One X did both Dolby Vision and HDR10. Actually, I think it does. I think, yeah. I think it's a X software thing. So if it's not turned on, it could be. They easily could turned fix on. it. They yeah. could fix it. But I mean, un unfortunately, you can't assume that they're going to fix it. They right. just might want to sell you a new one. So does uh, let me let me ask the chat room because they'll know. D d and by the way, you'd probably be better off just buying a TV because it'd be cheaper and bigger. Way cheaper. Way and, cheaper. And probably do the job. The only reason to get a computer monitor for it is if you want a computer monitor, yeah. right? Well, but the computer monitor ones do look beautiful. There are a couple that are out right now that you can buy. They are crazy expensive. Uh, the best, by and far, and you were actually looking at this at the beginning of the show, is oh. the, the <laughs> Samsung CHG90. Okay, it's, we're going to get one of these just because <laughs> it's so funny. This absolutely supports HDR10. It's it's fifty some inches yeah. wide. Uh, well, 49. 40, so forty. Well, fifty by the time you include the bezel. It's, it's it, it basically it's four side by yep. side yep. Uh, HD monitors. Thirty-eight forty by ten eighty. Uh, it does one forty-four hertz refresh, free sync to fifteen hundred dollars. So that's a little pricey. Uh, big monitor, but that's still a little crazy pricey. That's probably not the one that I would go with. I kind of like the Acer Predator X27. A little less pricey. You're going to save about 500 bucks. Uh, uh, it's only 27 inches, but it also supports G-Sync and definitely HDR10. Uh, this is, is this an HDR jacket? Oh. This is a Tech TV uh, shirt. This is not the one you were talking about. The one you were talking about has an, uh, a big anime. Oh, yes. Yeah. I know which one yeah. you're talking about. No, that's... But uh, John, John, I did have a few of these. I think mm -hmm. they made these. I don't think they ever sold these. I think they made these for us 
you know when the, you know what I think happened? They made this for me when I was going on live with Regis and Kelly. They said, "Could you wear a Tech TV shirt?" And uh, Gelman said, "Absolutely not." So, <laughs> so I have these shirts, never worn, uh, but I wear them from time to time on the show. There you go. The, I, I I think I want that Samsung monitor, now but you do. it's really more for gaming, right? In fact, they show yeah. it, they show it on the Samsung site running Microsoft Word this wide. I see no reason. I, I would use it for video editing because that's an awesome timeline. Because then you could have. Yeah. Would you really? Would you have the timeline go all the way oh, across? Gosh, yes. Or maybe just go halfway across and then use the, oh, no, I, all the way? I, I want to see the whole clip. I want to see I'm it all, it. baby. Oh. Uh, that is a crazy looking... It looks like something went wrong at the monitor factory. Right. Yeah. Like they extruded too much of a screen or something. Now, if you, if you wanted inexpensive, the least expensive that I could think of that I would want, not, not the least expensive you can find, that I yeah. know that supports HD, uh, HDR10, I think it's the Samsung uh, the 70. So it's not it's not the 49 inch. It's a 27 inch version. It's a curved monitor, not as nice, uh, more closer to 2K resolution. But that's only going to cost you about six to seven hundred dollars. In my opinion, save the monitor for your yeah. computer and get a TV. You can then watch TV on it as well as play games. I'm with you. Uh, I'm running it on a, a the least expensive uh, OLED TV from LG, the B B line. And it looks fantastic. It looks, nice. it it looks look nice. so great. And then you can watch uh, Stranger Things on it and yeah. some other stuff. Save the computer monitor for the computer. Well, it's, uh, so often we have to talk yeah. people out of using TVs on computers. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. And, and here's the thing. The prices are going to drop. Right now, it's just there's, there's such competition and there's such scarcity of these parts that, uh, like, for example, the Acer, the 27-inch, it's selling $300, $400 above list right now. Because people want it. Because people want it. Yeah. So if you wait, the technology is going to get standardized. They're all going to do HDR10, and then you're going to get a larger monitor for less money. So do what oh, the Oh, there's a Predator. How wide is that Predator? <laughs> is, that the, is that a 34 or 27? <laughs> See... Yeah, 34. Now, if I put that or the or the 49 inch monitor on an Xbox, would it automatically use the screen that's, properly? You know what? I think that's why you have to buy. We oh, have we to have to buy one to find out. Okay. Oh, yeah. Right. See, that's folks, a good excuse. Leo doesn't want this tech. He's doing it for you. Well, of course, I bought a 1300. A dollar. I remember that. 40, well, you remember it because you're using <laughs> it. Forty. What is it? A 43-inch monitor? Uh, a 43-inch monitor. That thing is beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's four uh, HD screens in a square, yeah. right? It, the strange thing is, Leo, every time I leave the studio for an extended amount of time, I steal it. it disappears. <laughs> I, I have to go it. get it back. I want it back. But uh, <laughs> the truth is, it's not a good monitor because you, 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 if you're sitting this close, yeah, it's, it's too big. Is, it's kind of big. You're looking like this. What's up there? What's up there? It's the only tan I get <laughs> indoors all the it's time. It's huge. <laughs> but this might, wide like this, especially because it kind of wraps around, yeah. it would fill your peripheral vision. That would be good for like a driving game or a flight flight simulator. It'd be pretty amazing. Well, they really sell that monitor as a uh, stockbroker's screen, so you can have four different displays. The one you us, have yeah. is more of a more for yeah. a, tra a day trader, yeah. All right. All right. Well. So that's our HDR question. Let's go on All to right. a, your turn. A networking question. This yes. comes from Rob. Rob says, "ITNSS, I flashed my Netgear wireless router with DDWRT and have been fairly happy with it. It's a good choice. Yes, it's been almost three years, and I'm looking at purchasing a new one." I bought my parents' Eero, and I love the up-to-date features and continual upgrades available. I'd like the same type of support, but don't need mesh for the cost of functionality. Any advice on manufacturers outside of these new mesh providers that we can count on for regular security firmware software updates? Thanks so much for your help. You're going to have your favorites, but what about a router that supports DDWRT? Yes. Um, then, you could, then you would have the best of both worlds, a modern router but up-to-date software, for instance, DDWRT fixed crack bef the day it was announced it was mm -hmm. fixed, right? Mm -hmm. So there are advantages to using a, a, a firmware. I like the ASUS because they took DDWRT. Mm. Yep. They made their own uh, version of DDWRT. My experience has been they keep those up-to-date. I have one of the ASUSes with, that looks like a spider. It has six antennas. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that one. Uh, I, th I think they're quite good. They have ha been dinged for some security issues for older ones. I think the new ones are fine, though. What do you like? Uh, I have got. I want to do two sides. So on the high end, I'm still all about the Synology routers. I love their line of routers, mostly because their security updates come immediately. Are they pushed or do you and have to get And they're automatic. Yeah. So you can just click, say, yeah, go ahead and update. And it will do it at the time that you suggest like that. and yeah. you're good to go. Yeah. Also, because I'm invested pretty heavily in Synology NASs, so it's nice to have 
my uh, my single uh, maintenance display show everything, including the NASA. So and when the you router. get DSM updates, you also get router updates. Correct. It's all part of Correct. the same thing. Okay. Now the RT twenty six hundred is the one I'd think of. Uh, it's a little pricey. How though. much? You're you're well, you know over two hundred. Okay. Uh, depending on where you buy it from. Don't save money on a router. Don't These save money, yeah. days, a good router is going to be around two hundred dollars. I think, and you want to spend that money. But I'm with you in that if I didn't want to spend that much money, the Asus routers, for my money, are probably the best all-around bargain. Um, and the, on the low end, I would take the, uh, the they call it the 66U. Yep. Nice, no, no frills, not crazy fast, but it will get all the updates that Asus pushes out to their other routers, and that's going to be less than $100. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, Asus, Synology, any company that does updates, that's the one that you want. Forget the features, just look for the updates because the features don't matter a whit if suddenly you find out that your router has a hole that hasn't been patched for four years. Right, right. That is one of the advantages of mesh of the mesh yeah. systems is you don't even get a notification. They just update just behind the scenes. They're actually watching activity and they pick a time that it's not that nobody's using the internet yeah. and they update and they do it quickly and transparently. Um, our heroes and Eero, we should mention as a sponsor, our heroes are updating all, it feels like all the time. They, for instance, within 24 hours, they updated for Crack. That actually would be a good one to see. Crack is not a router problem specifically, no. it's a client problem. But of course, mesh routers have clients joining mm -hmm. it. The, the secondary satellites are clients. And so that would be a vulnerability that all mesh routers would be subject to. That would be a good thing to look. See if the router is updated for the most recent router problems. You know, what is that Reaper? thing that's going around, yeah, the, yeah. The, the bot giant botnet taking advantage of routers that haven't been updated in years. We still don't know what that's being used for, do we? No. It's just sitting there get growing but and that's, growing and growing. That's the new trend. It's just, it's not a botnet that does something. It's a botnet that's waiting to, waiting do, something. to do something. That's yeah. the one that scares me. Uh, and Reaper, it looks like it's a nation state behind it. It's yeah. got a Lua front end, so you can, it, can do, it can change its capabilities. It actually reminds me of that thing in, uh, in Stranger Things. <laughs> that's just kind of putting its tentacles out, and and we'll see what it plans uh, down the line. Anyway, uh, that's one reason it's so important. Anything that goes on the internet, but, but particularly your routers, that they be updated and they be yeah. updated regularly. Yeah. In fact, if your router is more than two years old, it's time for a new one. Yeah. I think you should. I think we have to start thinking of routers not as devices that never get updated, but as devices that periodically, like every few years, you get a new one. Uh, you're going to get better, more reliable uh, internet access, and you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the herd. You're protecting all of us by having a secure system. Yeah, a long time ago, we switched from the mentality of protect the core, protect the core, to who cares if you protect the core if all the bad guys own the edge? Yeah. And if all those consumer routers are owned and I can manipulate them, then it, and then I can news. take anything down. Yeah, and we've, we've already proven that, unfortunately. It's the kind of thing they talk about on Twyat this yeah. week in Enterprise Tech every week with Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit. You'll also catch him on Know How twice a week, twit.tv slash KH. Love that Know How show, at Padre SJ on the Twitter. And uh, always a welcome uh, co-host here on the new screen. Oh, I love Thanks doing it here. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and, so much and fun. And next time, here. the Shinobi shirt, though. I promise you. Got to do that. I pro remind me, Jerry, when Robert's going to be on again. I don't even know its name. Shinobi. The full Shinobi. I know what you're talking about. The full Shinobi. You played that game when you were. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. Oh, I wasn't. Maybe I'm not. a little older okay, than you, yeah, Robert. I know. Okay, I got it. Got it. The <laughs> games we played as kids were jacks. Dominoes, I Hopscotch. think Candyland, Shoots and Ladders, that kind of thing. They don't have those anymore. <laughs> we do the screensavers, the new screensavers, every Saturday afternoon about 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2300 UTC. Please stop by, watch us live if you do. Hang out in the chat room so that we can see you and you can see us. IRC.twit.tv. All our best jokes come from the chat room. They do. Yeah, and I'm talking about the people, not the jokes. Oh, They're, no. Oh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm a kidder. I love this. I love the chat. You can also you can also watch on demand. Uh, all you have to do is go to twit.tv slash NSS. That's our special page for the new screensavers. And like every show, we offer audio and video downloadable on any platform, any way you want it. Best thing, though, to find your favorite podcast application and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We're putting the best ofs together right now. If there's a moment in the past year on the new screensavers that you really enjoyed, you thought it would be fun to put in the best of, we're going to air those uh, from uh, Christmas Day through New Year's Day. 
this year. The Christmas Day is on Monday. I was going to show up. I mean, if you don't. No, hit, please don't. I'm just gonna, please don't. Right. We're going to we're going to do a best of. Uh, just go to twit.tv slash best of if you've got anything that you thought would be a good part of that show. Uh, you don't have to remember all the details. Just give us whatever you remember, and that'll help Anthony and the other editors put something together uh, for you for the holiday season. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Screen savings. Bye-bye. Bravo! Bravo! <laughs>